Hello, and welcome to the Intro to Houdini course. Today we're going to be covering part two of the pyro effects lesson. In part one, we learned how the pyro effects works, but today we're going to learn how to manipulate the DOP network to customize the look of our effects. Since we spent a lot of time last lesson learning how to control the look of the fire and the smoke, uh, this lesson isn't going to focus very much on that. Instead, we're more concerned with getting the pyro sims to behave in the way that we want to. Uh, you can always go back and dial in the details after you get the overall behavior locked down. Uh, we've got three effects that we're going to create today, so let's go ahead and get started with the first one. In the last video, we started out with objects that were already on fire, but a lot of the time we might want to start off with something like a match, which we use to light something else on fire. This first example is going to show you how we can set up a dormant fuel source that will ignite when it's exposed to a flame. It's perhaps a movie cliche at this point, but we're going to make an oil barrel that is spilling oil onto the ground. There will be an open flame nearby which will set all of the oil on fire uh, when the oil comes into contact with the flame. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started by making the barrel, and uh, we're also going to be using a few uh, dynamic objects, so we're going to want to drop in a ground plane as well. Uh, let's start with the ground plane from the rigid body shelf. And then we're going to use a tube to make the base of the barrel. It's not going to be a very fancy barrel. Uh, we just need kind of the rough shape. So we'll pull the tube up, make sure to add the end caps on. And I'm just going to change the primitive type to primitive instead of polygon so that we get the smooth edge. And um, maybe make the height a little bit taller. I'm going to copy and paste the tube and make a smaller version of it so that, it, oh, hang on. We should make sure that we have the first tube templated so that we can see the second one in relationship to it. Uh, the second tube we're going to use as sort of like the, like the opening, the mouth that the oil is going to spill out of. So we're going to, oops, have the wrong one selected. Uh, we're going to make the height smaller. Not that small. And we're going to lower the radius as well. Something like that ought to do it. So we'll just go ahead and place the, oops, go ahead and, I've got the wrong tool selected here. Go ahead and place the opening, just sort of to one side of the barrel. Um, it doesn't matter like a whole much a whole bunch where it's at. We're just going to merge it together. And that looks good enough for uh, what we need it to be. So let's go back up to the object level. Um, right now the barrel's kind of sitting up in the middle of the air and there's no way it's going to be able to realistically spill oil like this. So let's rotate it so it's laying on its side. Let's see, negative 90 degrees. Also pull it up a little bit so that it's not sitting through the ground plane. There we go. Bring it back a tad. Okay, so we've got a good base for the barrel. It's in a good position. Uh, to emit particles from it, we're going to duplicate this opening piece of geometry, and we're going to use that as a source object for the particles. So let's start by renaming this tube object to barrel. And then I'm just going to copy and paste the node so I don't have to do as much work later. And we'll call this uh, particle source barrel. And we can delete the first tube. Now we have the second tube all by itself. Uh, we can actually delete the merge node too. And uh, we don't want to emit the particles right on top of the piece of geometry uh, that it's being emitted from. Otherwise, we're going to get some weird collisions. So we're going to put a transform node down and just kind of push this out a little bit. Oops, not in the X direction. 
in the y direction. There we go. And we could also scale it maybe a little bit too. Like 0 0.1. We'll have to bring it up more on the y axis. Something like that. Uh, oops. The important part is to make sure that the geometry isn't uh, intersecting the actual barrel or the mouth of the barrel. Uh, otherwise, some of our particles might not work the way we want them to. Um, okay, now that we have the source for the particle object, um, we are going to uh, turn it into an emitter. So if we go to the particle shelf and there is a button called Source Particle Emitter. Uh, making sure that we have this particle source barrel object selected, we're going to click that button. And we're going to give it a minute. Oh, and my frame is at 189, so there's going to be a bunch of particles all over the place. Let's go ahead and put that back to zero. If we hit play, we can see that a bunch of particles come spilling out of the mouth of the barrel all over the ground. Um, it's a pretty good start, but we can make it look a little bit better than that. Um, if you notice, it's put us in the AutoDOP network. Let me go ahead and just make this a little larger so that we can see. Actually go back out to the object level. It's created this AutoDOP network, uh, nothing that we're not familiar with at this point. Um, Sorry. Some of the times when you make this, it'll uh, tend to kind of overlap these nodes and you won't be able to read everything, so I like to separate them out a little bit. Um, you can also hit L and see if it lays it out better, but I like laying it out myself. Okay, so there's a couple things that we can change in the settings here. Um, first of all is the pop object. We can go down to the physical tab and control a couple of the behaviors of the particles. Um, right now, I think they're spilling out just a little bit too freely and uniformly. Um, it would be nice if they, for instance, had a little bit of friction. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to keep you know, rolling on forever and ever, uh, as long as they keep spilling out. So if we have some friction, it'll start to slow down and then pool up and stop moving. Uh, we can also lower the bounce and the bounce forward. That'll keep it from uh, that'll keep it from going too far as well. Uh, if you happen to place the mouth of your barrel up higher on the on the barrel rather than closer to the ground, uh, you're going to want to make sure that the bounce is considerably lower so that it doesn't um, so that it doesn't bounce, you know, like a rubber ball when the particles hit the floor. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very fluidy oil like behavior from the particle. So let's rewind and see what these settings give us. Ooh, that's a little way too much. Huh. Let's lower the friction, give the bounce forward some more. Let's keep dialing it in. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, we lost a lot of the movement, but we're going to add some of it back here in this next change. So in the uh, particle source, uh, barrel source, if you named it the same way that I did, there is uh, some birth attributes that we can change here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change the constant birth rate. Uh, right now, it's birthing a lot of particles, uh, 5,000 every second, and we can get away with lowering this number, probably by half we'll try at first, uh, 2,500. Since we don't need all these particles and we just need sort of the rough shape to make a fluid object out of, um, we don't need all 5,000, and this will speed it up quite a bit. Now, we can also go into this Attributes tab, and in the Attributes tab, uh, we have some like inherent velocity parameters, and this is going to uh, this is going to help the 
particles kind of look like they're spilling out of the barrel some more. So this is where we're going to add some of that movement back in that we just took out. Um, this is the x-axis, if we look down here in the viewport, uh, where the particles are spilling out of. So let's give it some velocity on the x-axis, like maybe 1. One's always a safe number to start off with. Okay, that's not too bad. Maybe we can change it a little bit higher, maybe to two. And uh, we can add some variance in here as well. Um, if we add some variance on the Z axis, maybe give the Z axis some two variance. then it'll just kind of fan out a little bit more uh, in the z-axis. Uh, you could give the x-axis some variance too, um, a little bit more than one. I don't really think it'll make that big of a deal, but it might make the pattern of the fuel that you've spilled uh, look a little bit more, uh, maybe look a little more random and natural. Let's see. One more thing we can do is we don't need it spilling fuel the entire time. Uh, we've got a pretty good looking uh, puddle of particles right now at about frame 55 or 56. We can actually tell it to stop making particles after this point if we want to. Uh, so we can go back into the birth settings and keyframe the constant activation at 1 and then just step forward one frame and key that down to 0. So. Uh, a lot of these parameters you're probably familiar with if you remember back to the uh, where we were making the red blood cells. We played with a lot of these settings before, so um, if you find yourself a little unfamiliar with a few of these, you can go back and uh, check out part two of the attributes video, and uh, we've covered uh, we've covered some of those settings there before too. So let's see what this looks like now, and just make sure that. We're happy with the way the simulation looks. Hmm. One thing is that that kind of just stopped spilling off really quickly there. Uh, there was a lot of particles coming out, and then one frame later, there suddenly were zero. So maybe we could fix that. So which frame do we do that on? Frame 56? 57. So let's keep the activation at 1 at 57, and let's instead have this value kind of taper off for a few frames down to 0. That way, instead of being you know, a value of 1 at 1 frame, and then an instant later being a value of 0, it has a chance to kind of like have the stream of particles slow down as opposed to cut off entirely. That looks a lot better. So we'll call that good for the particles for now. Um, let's go ahead and turn these particles into fuel. Um, right now, we, uh, we need to make the particles a fluid object. As they are right now, they're just particles, and those can't be used uh, directly as fuel. Um, so the thing that we're going to have to do is, uh, in this source particles node that was created, um, this node was created when we uh, clicked the source particle emitter button with the particle source barrel um, piece of geometry selected. And this is just importing that dynamic simulation from the dot network so that all we have in this node is just the particles themselves. And that's very handy because we can take these particles and we can drop in a node called particle fluid source, or I'm sorry, uh, particle fluid surface. And if we connect the particles to it and enable the visibility, you will see that it has turned the particles into a sort of mesh. Now, there's some holes in it every once in a while. The normals are a little messed up on the edge. Um, we can fix some of this by changing the method from average position to metaball. 
Uh, that'll make it look a little bit smoother. Um, when you're doing this kind of particle to surface uh, operation, what it's really doing is it's taking all of the positions of the particles and then it's sort of expanding a radius out from each individual particle. Let's see if we can visualize it like this a little better. Um, it's sort of creating a blob that expands out from each particle and this blob's radius is um, is called point radius scale here and when it's really low um, the blobs only appear in places where the particles are clumped up very close together and then as we increase this point radius scale the blob sort of smooths out and gets larger. Um, now the way to make this look really nice and really detailed is to lower this step size here. Uh, right now it's at 0.1 evenly across the board. You could you could easily take it down to 0.01 and even more so you know beyond that and in that case let's just let's just do that right now real quick and see what this looks like so pay attention to the what the detail looks like here if we change the step size down let's say to twice the resolution now you can see that we can lower the point radius scale and get a lot more detail and we could keep doing that process over and over again you know down to point one whoop is it going to go to point one oops my houdini kind of froze there for a second let's go back to frame one and just input these values manually So you can see this is running quite a bit slower and that mesh is pretty dense when we have a step size of 0.1. But we'll just stop it on frame 12 here. We can lower this point radius scale by quite a bit now. And then you see we have even more detail. So as you go higher or lower and lower in this step size and lower and lower in this point radius scale, you can make this fluid look a lot more like a fluid and less like a big blob of clouds. Um, However, we don't really want to do that right now. It's, it would take quite a while in order to uh, calculate this in addition to the pyro simulation. Uh, one thing that we could do is once we get this pyro simulation figured out, we could come back and then dial in what this fluid should look like. Um, and then we could cache out the fluid simulation and then render out a much higher resolution uh, pyro effect simulation. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and stick with a step size of 0.1 and we'll probably have to have the radius scale around like 1.5 or so uh, just just so that this the edges still kind of look like a fluid so that'll be pretty good for now Okay, so we've converted our particles into geometry, and now we can take our geometry and turn that into a, uh, into a fluid source. So it's kind of a two-step process. If you remember when we were using the shelf tools just to make uh, uh, like that default flame, for instance, it goes straight to this uh, fluid source node from the geometry. Well, that doesn't really work super well with particles, so uh, we need to do this particle fluid surface first, um, at least in this specific scenario, uh, so that we can get the fluid source to look the way we want it to. Okay, so we've got this cloudy looking fluid, and it kind of looks okay. It's spreading below the ground plane, but right now that's actually not going to matter. Um, Again, this fluid source is going to look like what the particle fluid surface came from, so that kind of goes back to you know increasing the resolution of this, um, you know later when all is said and done. Um, by default, this fluid source uh, it doesn't have the correct attributes to catch on fire. 
right? Remember that when something is going to catch on fire in a pyrosim in Houdini, it needs to have two things. It needs to have temperature and it needs to have fuel. Well, in this case, we want the oil to be the fuel for this pyro simulation, but we don't want it to have temperature. Uh, if it has temperature, then the barrel is just going to be spilling burning fuel out onto the ground, um, which is not what we want. We want it to spill out fuel that is not on fire, so that it, when it does touch a flame, it then catches on fire. So uh, we haven't really done this yet because the shelf tools have uh, taken care of this part so far for us. Uh, let's go ahead and look at how to manually convert this fluid source from whatever its default settings are into a usable fuel source. So it's actually not that difficult. Uh, if you see up here in this top row of tabs, there is a container settings. If we change the initialize from source smoke to source fuel, I passed it up, it was the second one. It's going to change the values in scalar volumes for us. Now we have a source attribute, which is fuel, and it's giving us uh, fuel and temperature. Remember, we don't want temperature, otherwise this is going to catch on fire by itself during the pyrosim. So we can just go ahead and remove the temperature attribute. So all we're left with is the fuel. Rewind and hit play. We can see that our fuel source is spilling out onto the ground uh, quite nicely. And then here around frame 70, it's going to stop spilling out and we're going to be left with just a puddle of fuel on the floor. So that's exactly what we want, um, but that's only half of the equation. Let's go ahead and put our flame. So, oops. So in this imaginary scenario, um, I'm just going to say that there's a piece of burning debris uh, sitting next to this barrel, and that's what's going to cause all this oil to catch on fire. Um, we don't need anything fancy for this uh, flame source, so let's just go ahead and make it a sphere. And it'll be important to hit play on our simulation and kind of wait until the shape of the simulation settles down a little bit. So we know that our simulation of the fuel spilling is going to roughly end kind of right here. Uh, if we have our flame sitting right next to the barrel, then all the fuel is going to catch on fire as soon as it spills out, and it's not going to look very neat. Um, as long as we're setting things on fire, why not have it look cool, right? So. I think it would look much cooler if the oil spilled out all onto the ground and then a little piece of something that just happens to be burning catches on the whole thing on fire from the edge. That'll probably be a good position for a flame. So I've just positioned the sphere sort of on the ground near the edge of where this fuel spills out. It doesn't need to be super precise, and if you accidentally put it a little too far outside, um, it's not going to take a whole lot of like recaching time in order to move it towards where you want it to go. Uh, so don't fret about that. Let's see. I'm going to rename a few objects here just to make this a little easier to deal with. I'm going to change the source particles name to oil spill because that's what it is. And I will take sphere object and just call it uh, flame source. And to make the flame source, uh, we now know how to make it from scratch. So we could actually do that if we wanted to. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and use the shelf tool because um, it'll be good enough. We'll just use the default flames. Oh, it's telling us that it's going to convert to world space, and that's fine. All right, so let's look at what we have here. If we hit play, we have our fuel spilling out. We have a burning object on the edge of where the fuel is going to hit. And then at the moment that the fuel hits the fire, 
nothing happens. And you might be wondering why nothing's happening. Well, this fuel isn't catching on fire because we haven't told the pyro simulation network that this fuel is allowed to be interacted with by this flame. Uh, to do that, we actually need to import this fuel into the pyro simulation. So let's do that. Our pyro simulation is found in the Autodot network. It's looking a little more complicated than it has in the past. But it's really just a bunch of pieces we've seen before all cobbled together. So this group here on the left is our ground plane. This group in the middle is our particles. This group over here on the right is our pyro simulation. So if you remember this source fuel from flame source, source, it's got source on it twice. Oh, that's because I named it source. Um, this uh, source volume node over here, uh, this is what's responsible for this flame object. So it, remember, it's taken that sphere, it's converted it into a, uh, into a fuel object, and that fuel object is injecting uh, fuel and temperature into this pyro simulation. However, that's the only fuel and temperature that the simulation is aware of right now. Um, that's actually why this merge node uh, comes into play right after this, uh, this source volume node. It's so that we can plug in a bunch of different source volume nodes for the pyro solver to interact with. So let's go ahead and plug in the fuel that we have. Uh, we're gonna drop in a source volume node plug it into the merge and it's going to ask us for our volume path and we are going to choose oil spill hit accept let's give us some more room and uh, in the initialize parameter instead of source smoke we want to change it to source fuel Now we've got a few parameters here that we very briefly looked at last time, um, but not really in too much detail. Uh, we don't need all of these uh, volume, temperature, and uh, velocity parameters for the fuel. Um, in fact, really the volume is the only thing that matters uh, for this particular simulation. Um, temperature is specifically like we really don't want to have this in our simulation because uh, if there's any temperature whatsoever that crosses the the ignite threshold then this oil is going to catch on fire too soon so we're going to change the scale temperature down to zero just to make sure uh, that we're not injecting any temperature uh, even though we shouldn't be because we we removed that value uh, previously um, down here in this fuel source. Uh, remember, we removed that temperature value. Uh, that's why. But just to be doubly sure and extra cautious, um, it's never a bad idea to change the scale temperature down in your fuel source uh, before the object merge as well, just to make sure that uh, nothing goes wrong. Um, one more thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the pyro node and the division size is set to 0.01. I'm going to make it a little larger, maybe 0 0.05, um, just because with this particle simulation being converted to geometry, which is then being converted to a, uh, into a fluid, interacting with another fluid and a pyro simulation, uh, we've got a lot of things going on here, and it might be a little slow to run that at a division size of 0 0.01, especially when we're uh, still tweaking things right now. So let's keep it at 0 0.05 for now. Our golden rule of we can always make it look nicer later. So uh, let's rewind it and hit play and see what this looks like. There we go. Sorry, I had the, uh, if you have these handles on, sometimes it's really hard to see what's going on. Um, our flame is still here, 
it just looks really really dim because the object is really small and I've changed the division size to be almost the size uh, of that particular part of the flame. That doesn't mean that the flame's any weaker, it just means that uh, it's a lower resolution, but we'll still be able to see what's going on. So the fuel is spreading and it's about to hit the flame. And let's see what happens. Okay, so that flashed up really big, but it's stuck in the little square. Um, this is an instance where the resize container is uh, is actually causing a problem for us. Um, it's not able to keep up with the expansion of this flame quickly enough. So we could do a few things. Uh, the first thing we could do is we could increase this padding here. Um, the padding is sort of like uh, an extra boundary on the edges of the uh, container so that if your uh, if your pyro simulations start spreading faster, um, this padding will will check to see if it's if it's spreading you know past whatever this padding value is, and it will start resizing to accommodate that. Uh, however, we don't have a super huge simulation here. It's not going to affect it that much if we just go ahead and bypass the resize container for now. Um, Yes, that'll mean that we're running the calculation on everything inside the container, but you're not actually going to notice that much of a slowdown in this scenario. Um, and so, since it's so small, I think I would rather just take my chances. So, so we're selecting the pyro container here, and we're just going to increase the boundary of it manually. This way we can make sure that it encompasses the whole fuel spill. That looks pretty good. Oh, let's not forget about the Y boundaries because the flame may get kind of large so we don't want it clipping off at the top too. All right, that looks pretty good. So let's rewind it and hit play and see what this does. Turn off the handles before we do so. So now the fuel is approaching the flame, but this time it should not get clamped uh, by the small uh, by the small boundary size. So here we go. The first couple flames or frames of the flame being ignited are happening. And now we get something else that we don't quite want. So in the period of about half a second, this entire uh, puddle of oil just exploded, uh, quite literally exploded here. Um, that's because a small amount of flame came into contact with a huge amount of fuel. It spread very, very rapidly, and um, it's, all, it's all physically based, so it is kind of what you would expect to happen if you threw a match uh, into a lot of fuel. This is not the look that we want, though. Uh, not the look at all, right? Uh, if you you know, see those dramatic scenes in movies where a match hits a, you know, a puddle of oil, you kind of see the flame ripple across the, the surface, and that's more of the look we're trying to go for. Um, not quite an explosion here. So let's, uh, let's figure out how to fix this problem. It turns out that it's a pretty easy solution. Um, this has actually been a whole lesson of pretty easy solutions, so that's good. If we go back to our source volume node where we brought in the oil spill, um, you'll remember there is this scale source volume uh, parameter here. Right now it's set to 1, and uh, it's just a scaling value, so we can lower it, say 2.1. And that will act as though we have given this simulation a tenth of the fuel that we actually did. So we can play this back 
with the uh, volume scale at point 1, and now I'll check out how the flame reacts. Okay, now this is the behavior that we wanted. We've got a much nicer look now where the fire hits the fuel and it ripples out across the surface much like we would expect it to. I'll just scrub through instead of hitting play. Even though it's cached, it's still playing back a little slow. So That's a really nice look that we have there. Um, one thing that we could do to see this flame a little bit better, if you recall from last lesson, we can go into the pyro node, into the, uh, the multi-view. Uh, we have this density parameter here, which remember that smoke is... Uh, smoke is represented as density. We can just kind of lower the the top value of the smoke here so that we see the flame a lot better. Um, a simulation like this wouldn't produce a ton of smoke anyways, so let's scrub through that one more time without the smoke obscuring it. And there we go, we've got a really nice ripple. Alright, so there you have it for the first example. Um, it's important to note that uh, your source fuel could be anything, uh, as long as you properly convert it to a volume first. So we use particles in this example just because uh, it gives us a little something fun to do. Um, but you could just as easily have it be a static object, like if you wanted to have a crumpled up piece of paper catch on fire, or maybe like... Uh, like a campfire like we had last week, or a wooden structure like a cabin or something. Um, you know, you could take that static geometry and turn it into, uh, into fuel source as well. Um, if you wanted to take this example further, um, you could always add a fuel source to the barrel too, so that it explodes when the fuel inside catches fire. Um, you know, maybe even turn the barrel into a dynamic object that spills it in a more random pattern. You know, you can do a lot of things um, uh, when you start adding a bunch of different fuel sources into the same pyrosim. Um, but uh, that's enough for, uh, for this example. Uh, let's move on to the next one. In this next example, we're going to show you how to blend between two different pyro simulations as well as creating an external wind force that can interact with the simulation. Uh, to do this, we're going to be making an effect where there's a candle with a flame that reacts to the wind. Uh, the wind's going to blow and then let off and then get a little stronger and then let off. And finally, it's going to gust really strong and it's going to blow the flame out. And at that point, we're going to transition from a candle flame simulation to a thinner puff of smoke simulation. Uh, with a little thin trail coming off at the end. Uh, and both simulations are going to act with the same wind force, so it's going to look like the candle flame was extinguished from the wind and turned into smoke. Uh, so it'll look, you know, to any other observer, it'll look like one uh, effect is happening, but on the back end we're actually be, we're going to be blending two different effects together. So the first step, kind of like the barrel, we're going to start off by making a really simple candle. So I'm going to start with a tube again. Let's zoom in a little. Let's call this candle. And make it a little taller like a candle should be. Turn the end caps on. Make another tube, merge them together. Uh, the second tube will be the stem, or the wick, the stem. Let's turn the radius down to like 0 0.1 or something. It's going to be really thick wick. <laughs> so. There we go, close enough. It's good enough to practice this on. Uh, our candle modeling skills don't have to be top notch for this example. Um, so next we need to make the simple object for the flame to emit from. Like in most of our other examples, we're gonna use the sphere too. Uh, first though, 
Let's change this tube into a primitive. Doesn't really matter, I just like seeing the smooth edges, because why not? So, okay. Let's drop the sphere. This will be the source of our flame. Um, make it smaller, maybe 0.1. Yeah, being roughly the radius of the wick is a good place to start. And we can just kind of put it near the top, kind of mostly inside, but still peeking out a little bit. Again, the sphere, remember this part, this is going to be hidden when we turn it into a simulation, so uh, it doesn't matter that it's visible right now. So, And we also are not going to distort the surface of the sphere like we've done in the past. Um, remember that when we have kind of choppy looking surfaces, we have these really interesting looking flame patterns. Uh, we actually want a really plain shape for the candle flame, you know, since candle flames don't have a whole lot of variation to them. Um, to be better organized, we're actually going to duplicate this sphere. So we're going to have two emitters. This one's going to be called flame source. And the second one is going to be called smoke source. Uh, we could actually use the, uh, the same sphere for both, but uh, if we wanted to change one of the two sources, then we'd have to go back and split it up later anyways. It, we might as well just save ourselves the trouble now. Like, um, say the flame is a little bit too big or the smoke plume, we want it to be a little smaller. Uh, we could just go back in and change the scale of these uh, without affecting the other simulation that we might have already, you know, finished. So, um, kind of personal preference, but um, I think it's a good practice. So, let's, uh, let's start by doing the flame. We're going to select the flame source, and we're going to use the candle preset. Um, this doesn't do really anything different than the flames preset did, or like the smokeless flame preset. Um, it makes the exact same PyroSim network that we've seen before. And indeed, you know, you can click on that and verify it yourself. The only thing that really changes is the default settings in the PyroSolver node. Um, most importantly, the values here in the shape um, are trying to give it a simpler looking flame. Um, they claim that it looks like a candle. Uh, it kind of looks like a candle. We can hit play and watch it. It starts off okay. And all of the simulations that we play usually have a big puff at the beginning. That's not quite what we want. I still think there's maybe a little bit too much fine detail here for a candle flame and that it uh, sticks up a little too much. Um, we probably want to go in here and turn uh, turn this buoyancy down a little bit, maybe to like one, so the flame doesn't rise quite so fast. Um, again, though, this lesson isn't going to be about getting the perfect looking candle flame, right? We learned all of those settings last time. Uh, we could spend a while dialing in this setting. Um, but if you really want to do that, you can do that after the lesson. Right now we're going to work on getting the uh, getting the bigger picture kind of simulation here. So um, while the default isn't 100% perfect, it's close enough for now. We can always go fix it later. So we've got the flame. Let's go ahead and add the smoke. And if you spotted the wispy smoke preset up there and thought, hey, let's use that, uh, you were right. We're going to use the Wispy Smoke preset. Make sure that you've got the smoke source selected when you do that, and it'll automatically apply it. And now we have two pyro simulations side by side. Which is just confusing enough to warrant some organization. So we're going to change this left pyro solver to pyro solver underscore flame we're going to change the right one to pyrosolver 
underscore smoke. That way we know the right side controls the smoke, the left side controls the flame, and when we need to jump back and forth between the two, um, we we don't ever get confused. So, And then especially if you, know, you were working on this one day and needed to come back and do something uh, a week later, then you'd be really confused if you hadn't named anything. So get into the habit of doing this. Um, if we check the pass-through, or the bypass on the... Uh, pyro node for the flame simulation. We can look at the wispy smoke simulation in isolation. Kind of play it here. This one I think does a lot better job than the uh, than the candle preset. I think that this wispy smoke, although it's got a few more details than I think it should, does a pretty good job of looking like something that's just been extinguished. So um, there's a couple more things though that I'd like to change about it, just to to get a look of something that has just been extinguished. So uh, the buoyancy lift default value. Let's make sure we've got the right one selected here. Goodness. Okay. The buoyancy lift default value is 0.4. We're going to double that so that the flame rises, or I'm sorry, the smoke rises very quickly. And then, um, just because I think that there's a little too much detail here on the fringe edges of the smoke, uh, we're going to change the dissipation down um, actually quite a bit, maybe to 0.1. If we replay that, we should get a simpler looking smoke. And that should also rise faster. Yeah, that rises a lot faster. We're also going to resize it up in the y-axis just a little bit. That way we can see the longer trail of smoke. And I think this will be a pretty good um, pretty good settings for the flame and the smoke as far as uh, as doing this candle flame interacting with the wind simulation. Okay, so the next thing is that we don't want the smoke simulation to start right away, right? It should only appear when the flame gets blown out. So we need to first pick a frame where we want the smoke to start coming out and for the flame to stop. Um, Let's see, we want the wind to blow a few times and like let off and then blow stronger so that, you know, so that we get the idea that the the wind is blowing the candle out. So if we let it play to maybe frame 120 and then have the smoke come, I think that'll be plenty of time. So we'll give it a second to do its calculations after skipping to frame 120. So by default, the pyro, oops, didn't mean to double click on that. The pyro sim is going to start at frame one. Uh, we can make it change to frame 20 though, if we select the pyro node, scroll all the way up to the top and there is a tab next to the properties tab called creation. If we check this creation frame specifies simulation frame box, um, we can control shift click to delete the keyframe on creation frame and change it to 120. That means that the smoke starts being created at frame 120 instead of frame 1. So now if we rewind it back to 0 and we hit play, we're going to see nothing until frame 120. And then right at frame 120, we're going to get a puff of smoke. So cool. That is what we wanted to do. Um, and let's do one more thing to the smoke. So, um, you've everyone's blown candles out before, right? Like, it's a it's a thing. It's an experience most people have. So I'm willing to assume that if you're watching this video, you know what it looks like when you blow a candle flame out. Um, I don't know if this is really true or not, but it feels true when you're blowing it out. So let's make it do that in the simulation. Whenever you blow the candle flame out, it always seems like the first puff of smoke is a little bit stronger than the little trail that follows afterwards. Um, I probably should have fact-checked that before I actually started recording the video, but 
um, that's how I see it whenever I blow a candle out. So we're going to make it do that. And if, if nothing else, it's going to look neat. And at best, we're going to make it look physically accurate. So um, we're going to do this by keyframing this scale source volume. So this is the uh, this is the exact same parameter that we used to lower the amount of fuel in the uh, in the oil spill simulation. In this one, we're going to use it to kind of create a burst of uh, of smoke in this simulation. So right at frame 120, we want the scale to be really high. Um, in fact, we're going to set the scale to 10 so that it creates this really big puff of smoke. So let's rewind and watch how big this puff of smoke is at frame 120. All right, so we're making like a ton of smoke right here. But we don't want it to start smoking like a chimney because that doesn't make a lot of sense for a candle either. Instead, it's going to have this really high value right when it comes out. But then over the course of maybe like 20 frames, I don't know, I'm just going to kind of eyeball it by looking at how much smoke is on the candle as I scrub forward. So, yeah, like right around like frame 138, let's just round it up to 140. Um, it looks like a decent puff of smoke has been created here, and I'm happy enough with this amount of smoke and maybe even a little less smoke than this um, to come out right when we blow the candle out the first time. So... At frame 120, we'll alt-click to keyframe that value to 10. And then at frame 140, we'll key the value back down to 1 so that it resumes normal candle flame smoke behavior. So let's play this back one more time to make sure that this is all looking good. So we got a big puff of smoke. And it dies down into something smaller. Looks nice. Yeah. Um, we're going to call that good for the smoke. And uh, we're going to disable it, actually. We're going to disable the pyrosim on the smoke. And we're going to concentrate on the flame. So back to the flame. Uh, we need to add wind now, right? We've got our two simulations. Um, the bulk of this example is about uh, making a cool effect, though, and without the wind, we don't get to do the cool effect. So uh, how do we add wind? If you just hit tab and type in wind, you'll notice that there's a couple different kinds of wind. Uh, pop wind, as you might guess, works on particles. And then there's these other two wind forces. We've got wind force and gas wind. Um, you will be really frustrated if you try to use wind force because it'll seem inconsistent at first. Um, wind force works on smoke, but it doesn't work on fire. Gas wind will work on both, so that's the one we want to use in this example. So let's drop down gas wind. Now, let me just go ahead and point this out right now because... This could confuse you if you're not 100% sure on how all this works. This gravity node here, um, after the merge and right before the output, uh, that's a force node. It has an input, meaning that a pyro sim has to go into it, and it also has an output, which means it feeds out into other things. This gas wind does not function like that. It does not have any inputs, which means you don't feed it in uh, down by the gravity over here. Um, even though when you look at the simulations here, it might make sense to put wind and gravity in the same spot. Uh, indeed, if you're doing the force wind node, uh, you would want to put it down here by the gravity. Uh, this gas wind node, however, this plugs directly into the pyrosolver node. So just make sure you're plugging it into the right spot. So let's go ahead and plug the gas wind in to the pyro solver. I'm just going to put it in the second last slot here. 
and right now by default it's uh, blowing in the x direction with a scale of 1. So let's see what that looks like. Actually I kind of want it blowing. Eh, it doesn't really matter if it's blowing left or right. Yeah, I want it blowing left. So let's have it blow in the negative x direction. If we hit play, let's see what we get. Okay, we've got a flame that exceeds the bounding box again. Let's just make sure that we've extended it. far enough to the left so that it doesn't get clipped. There we go. So immediately you can see that the wind force, uh, this gas wind, is affecting the flame. It's affecting the flame pretty strongly though, so I think we need to tone it down quite a bit. Um, maybe a value of like half that be 0.5 because it already looks like it's being blown out right now so all right that's kind of a nicer middle ground effect that'd be like maybe if there was a good constant breeze blowing maybe a little more than just a breeze but uh, blowing this flame backwards a little bit uh, it's kind of boring though uh, wind Wind shouldn't look boring. Wind should look very kind of chaotic. Um, if you have something that's just blowing at a constant 0.5 direction, you know, the whole time with the same amount of force, it's not going to look very natural at all. And then it's not going to look very believable when a big, strong gust of wind comes to blow the flame out. So uh, let's add some variance into it. Um, and let's do that with an expression. So instead of giving just a static value for the wind direction, we're going to type in a function, um, an expression actually. So I'm going to type it out first and then I'll explain what it is. It's not super long. So it's fit01 and then in parentheses we're going to type in rand for random and then in parentheses after the random, we're going to do dollar sign $f. Oops, I hit enter. So after the random dollar sign $f, we'll do comma, space, negative 1, comma, space, 0. So what does this function mean? Um, what this does is, well, let's look at the random first. Um, the first thing it does is it makes a random number, and the seed for this random number is uh, dollar sign $f, which is the frame, right? So that means that the random number that's generated is based on the frame number. Um, this means two things. First of all, it means that every frame we're getting a new number, and it also means that every time we play the simulation back, you know, we can play it back a hundred times, and it'll look exactly the same every time because the random number being generated is being based on the same numbers, right? 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. So that's actually a good thing because we want to make sure that um, when we're tweaking parameters that it behaves the way we're thinking. And if it's generating a new wind force every time, we're not going to be sure that what we, the changes we made um, actually made the difference or whether or not the wind was just doing something funny. All right, so that's what the random is doing. Uh, what is this fit zero one? So this fit zero one is a fitness, or I'm sorry, not a fitness function. It is just a fit function, um, which means that we're giving it two numbers, in this case, a value of negative one and zero, and it's forcing this random value to be in the range of negative one and zero. What that means is that the wind force is going to go between blowing all the way to the left and not blowing at all. Um, if we play this back, let's see what we get. We should get a much more random looking uh, flame now.
So I've let it play out for a few frames, and if we scrub through, we can see the end of the flame flickering kind of nicely as the wind blows. Um, this has given us a good uh, random pattern to the wind, but it's not really giving us that like easing in and out of like some gusts of wind that we want to. So to, to do that, we're also going to animate a different parameter, and that is the wind scale. So the wind scale is just a, um, a scaling value that gets multiplied to the wind direction. So we're going to start the wind scale off at zero. And remember, just alt left click to, to set the keyframe there. And then maybe around the first second, it's going a little slow. Um, we'll make the scale go a little higher. Now we determined before that uh, blowing like fully at the negative one value is kind of too strong. So let's just keep it at 0.5. So then we'll skip forward a little bit more, change the wind scale back down to zero. I'll hit escape so that the calculations stop going. It'll turn orange because it didn't have a chance to cache the simulation, but that's fine. Uh, we're just going to keep doing the same pattern of stepping forward and bumping the wind scale back and forth between uh, 0 and 0.5. We just type it in. It'll go faster. Okay, and then here at 96, we want to make sure to go back down to 0. And then... maybe a little weaker here at 120 because remember at or I'm sorry right before 120 whoop. 120 is the frame that we blew out the candle that's when the smoke starts so I gotta keep in escape here Let's make sure that the wind scale at 120 is really high. Maybe like 1.5. And then right before 120, the wind scale should be at zero. All right, so this way the wind's going up and down and up and down, and then right at 120, there's a big gust that blows. And then immediately after, maybe at frame 130, we'll keyframe it down to zero for the last time so that the smoke can just kind of silently move upwards. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, if you weren't 100% sure about why we were keyframing up and down and up and down, um, then this should show you why. Oops. I'm looking at the wrong... Nope. I wasn't looking at the wrong direction. Okay, here we go. So let's let this play out for a little bit and see how this looks. Okay, once that's uh, finished calculating, um, let's play it back and see what we've got. So now when we scrub through, uh, instead of the flame just kind of always leaning one direction, it's flickering between getting blown by the wind and then letting up a little bit. And then right here at, flame, at frame 120, the flame gets blown really strong. So we can actually just use uh, we can use a visual cue here to tell us when we want the flame to be blown out. So it's going along fine, and then a really strong wind comes here. That looks like a good value. So looks like frame 131 is where the flame should go out. To make the flame go out, we're going to click on the uh, the flame's source volume node. And we're going to keyframe the activation value. 
So it's going to be at a value of uh, 1 on that previous frame, so frame 130. And then we want it to be blown out on frame 131. So we're going to change the activation down to 0. And that will make sure that no more fuel comes from this source in the simulation. Let's play that back real quick and see what it looks like. And that's looking pretty good. That little piece of flame is maybe lasting longer than we want to, so if we want to later we could go in and um, change the pyrosulfur settings a little bit so that it goes away a bit faster. But really that just happened over the course of a few frames so it might not be the biggest deal in the world and we're getting this kind of a puff of smoke from that from the flame going out but uh, when we enable our actual smoke simulation for the second one um, we should be getting much bigger puff of smoke and it should look a lot more natural so let's rewind to the beginning and let's not forget to plug the gas wind into the pyro solver uh, for the smoke simulation too. And that's why I put the gas wind up here so high uh, in the node graph. That way it could reach to both sides without looking too awkward. So uh, make sure it's plugged into both. Uh, make sure that the uh, none of the bypass flags are set for either of the pyro simulation nodes. And let's hit play and see what our whole simulation looks like uh, when it's put together. Okay, as uh, I was caching this out and letting it calculate, I noticed that I forgot to change the boundary box settings for the uh, for the smoke pyro node. And I didn't just want to change it while the video was paused because then you might wonder why your smoke is disappearing. So, yeah. Um, it's a pretty easy to, mistake to make if you're work, working with a bunch of different uh, pyro containers, but try not to forget that you need to resize the smoke as well. So, yep, make sure to resize your smoke. So we'll rewind it one more time and then hit play and see what we get. Okay, let's take a look at what that gave us now that we have our smoke container properly resized. If we scrub through here, we see the flame acting as we expect it to. And when the big puff of wind comes, the flame is extinguished and the smoke comes out. So that's how we would go about uh, making two different pyro effects kind of blend into one. Um, if you wanted a few things to take this a couple steps further, um, to even further blend these two, uh, you might notice that right here at, I mean in my my simulation and your simulation may not look exactly the same, so um, you know that's where a bit of critical thinking comes in. But at around frame 141, 142, uh, I've got this puff of smoke that's a little bit lower than the flame that we're blowing out, and it's a candle so it wouldn't be super huge or super noticeable but we might like to get rid of this uh, of this bit of flame and that would be nothing more than uh, tapering off this source volume a couple frames before the activation goes down to zero uh, that way we don't have this big chunk of flame left over uh, here on this uh, source fuel node hmm. but other than that the effect looks pretty nice um, we have that big puff of smoke that we wanted right when the flame gets extinguished and then uh, you know it continues to sort of ripple outwards as the rest of the smoke starts to rise kind of steadily uh, from the center of the wick which is what we wanted it to do so um, so yeah there you have it that would be the second example let's go ahead and move on to the third and final example for the third and final example, we're going to be moving away from fire and looking at smoke. Um, one of the really big important things of doing effects, especially uh, 
at an effects studio or an animation studio is being able to make a uh, simulation that is also art directable, meaning that you, you're making a simulation. Uh, in this case, we're going to do smoke, and it's going to it's going to look some way however we create it and then maybe a supervisor or director is going to come look at it and say oh it looks really good but in in the spot in the middle can you make it curve to the left a little bit more um, it does no good if you just tell them no sorry that's how the wind force interacted with the smoke and uh, it just it kind of looks like that right um, you need to be able to uh, to make sure that the effect that you're creating is is also artistic and not just kind of computationally uh, and physically correct. So um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to make a puff of smoke that follows a customizable path. So uh, maybe you want to use this to like recreate some kind of magic effect like in Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter where uh, smoke is going to twist and swirl through the air and like a swirling, nodding kind of unusual pattern. Um, doing that's going to require us to manipulate the velocity of the pyrosim. So uh, let's jump to the blackboard real quick and look at how we're going to solve this. So in our pyro simulation, we're going to have a source, just denote it as S here, and that's going to create, you know, kind of a puff of smoke that's going to rise uh, out from the sphere that we're going to make it. Uh, however, in this case, what we want to do is we want to be able to draw a curve, any kind of arbitrary shape, maybe like this. And we want to tell the smoke to instead follow this path. And the way that we want to do that is on this curve, we're actually going to, uh, we're going to give it a direction. So the curve has no inherent direction. Uh, we're going to give it normals tangent to its path. So basically we're going to say, you know, at this point in the curve, you're going to have a normal pointing there. And then at this point in the curve, we're going to have a normal pointing here. And then at this point, we're going to have a normal pointing here. And so on and so forth. All the way down the edge of the curve, right? And then finally at the end, it will point in this kind of direction. But it will do this for every single point here along the curve. So after we've given the curve uh, some vectors, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put a bunch of points and we're going to scatter those around the curve. So I'll just redraw it roughly over here. I'll draw it a little better than that. That wasn't much better. So we're going to make a bunch of points all over, kind of randomly distributed around this curve. There will be many more points than this, but I'm not going to waste our time by drawing like 500 points. Um, we're going to put all these points here, and we're also going to give these points uh, a velocity for the velocity field in our pyrosim. And the velocity from these points is going to be taken from the uh, from the normals that are tangent to the to the curve's direction. So basically, at every point, we're going to have a velocity attribute that kind of looks like this. So finally, we need to bring this velocity field into the pyrosim network. But as we've seen before, it's not going to accept these points, uh, right? Instead, we need to turn it into a volume field first. So um, again, the volume field is going to be very similar to the automatic process that happens when you make the pyro object with the shelf tool, um, except instead of making a uh, instead of making like a fuel volume like we did with the uh, with the oil spill example, we're going to make a velocity uh, volume this time. And it's going to be kind of like that blobby looking surface again, sort of roughly in the shape of the curve. 
but inside of this blobby looking surface it's going to have a velocity field that it inherits from the points that it was made out of. So it's going to have a velocity field, you know, kind of like this in this flowing pattern. And this, whoa, that didn't work. This right here, there we go, this can be accepted into the PyroSim. So, um, you know, we're going to start off with just the curve. We'll do a couple different processes to turn it into this. Um, and then the cool thing about it is if we ever want to change the way the simulation looks, all we have to do is change the input curve and it will update this, uh, this velocity volume field for us and we can, um, we can just instantly change the smoke simulation the way we want it to look. So let's go back into Houdini. Okay, now that we're back in Houdini, let's go ahead and get started uh, making our smoke with our custom velocity uh, curve. We're going to start by dropping down a sphere, and we are going to use this sphere to emit our smoke. So let's just go ahead and call the sphere uh, Smoke Emitter. We're going to dive in real quick and just add a mountain sop. Um, remember that if we have interesting looking geometry, it usually produces more interesting looking pyrosims. So just have kind of a jittered looking surface here so that the smoke doesn't come out so uniform. Uh, when you've got your smoke emitter looking how you want it to, go ahead and in the pyro effects shelf, we're going to use the billowy smoke preset. Now the billowing smoke preset works, you know, sets up a simulation the same way as all the other pyro tools do except uh, instead of doing combustion this just does the smoke so uh, you will see no fire in the billowy smoke preset um, just let it play forward a few more frames here so that you can see what it looks like without any of the custom velocity fields that we're going to add to it so uh, this is what the effect looks like normally let's uh, go back up to our object level and get started making our custom velocity field. Uh, the best way to make the custom velocity uh, if we want it to flow along a curve is going to be a curve tool. So we're gonna select the curve button and uh, I'm gonna draw in the front viewport just so that I think it's a little easier to make sure that we're drawing on the same uh, on like a flat plane so I'm just gonna kinda rough out this curving S shape here so and we'll call that good let's go back to our perspective and make sure we're in the curve object and uh, let's get to work turning this curve into a velocity field. So the first thing we'll want to do is go back to the first frame. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we can actually see what we're working on here. Um, hit L to lay this out because I kind of lost sight of the curve. Alright, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is smooth the curve out because it's looking a little choppy. So I'm going to add a resample. Uh, to get a few more points and then a uh, smooth so this will just make sure that the edges aren't quite so harsh um, next is we want to give the, the c curve some thickness so we're gonna take it from a curve and make it into a tube uh, we've done this several times before so this process shouldn't be anything new uh, we're going to add a, uh, a circle then we are going to sweep the circle across the curve make sure to change the circle type to polygon and finally we're going to use a skin close it all up. 
All right, we've got our tube. Um, we can maybe make the radius of the circle a little smaller, but looks pretty good. Uh, next, we're going to scatter some points. So uh, drop down a scatter stop. And we're going to change a few settings in here. The first thing is I'm going to take the force total count off, and we're just going to do by density. And we're going to set the density scale up pretty high, like to 300. We want a lot of points in here. Uh, the more points we have, the more uh, accurately our velocity field will be. Uh, if we go too skimpy on the points, then we might have some like holes in our velocity field, and uh, the smoke may not follow along quite as tightly as we want it to. So after the scatter sop, we're going to drop down a point jitter. So what this point jitter does is it just takes the, uh, the scattered points and it kind of randomly offsets them. So uh, this just makes sure that we don't have all of our points looking um, you know, really uniform and right along the edge of that, uh, uh, right along the edge of the tube, right? Otherwise, um, we're going to have like a hollow sort of velocity field and we don't want that. So um, that default value of 1 is kind of working here. Just uh, You want it to look kind of fat, but you don't want the, um, you don't want a lot of uh, overlap between the different fields, uh, between the different directions, rather. So uh, like if this top part of the curve is starting to hit this part of the bend, you probably want to bring the scale back down a little bit. Um, again, we can always come back and fix this later. So. Uh, now that we have the points, let's go ahead and uh, add some velocity to them. Um, the first thing we need to do is we need to add velocity to this curve. So um, we're going to first, or sorry, rather, we're not going to add velocity to the curve. We're going to add a normal to the curve. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take the normal and we're going to use an attribute transfer to copy it on to the points. Um, that way we can use the normal information from the curve on the points to generate a velocity for each point. So to make a normal, we are going to drop down a polyframe. And uh, this default value for the normal and the tangent is actually not going to work for us. Uh, what we want to do instead, um, so right now the normal of this curve is actually pointing in the world's negative z direction. Um, the tangent is actually what we want, right? If you recall the blackboard drawing that we just drew, uh, we want the uh, we want the normal to be going along with this curve, which which is tangent to the curve. So we're going to deselect the normal, and we're going to change tangent name to n. Did I miss it? I'm going to change tangent name to n. There we go. So now that we have the normal as the tangent, we can take these points from the point jitter and we're going to do an attribute transfer. going to transfer from the curve oops from the curve to the points and uh, we can actually see this taking effect now if we put the mouse uh, in the viewport and hit D we can turn on uh, normal visualization for the points and we can see that the uh, that the normal direction of the points is indeed going along with the curve here just go down a little bit so we can see it better. So that's looking pretty good. We can go ahead and turn the normals off since we don't really need them. So the next thing is now that we have the normal information uh, per point, 
we need to create a uh, we need to create a vector, and this vector is going to hold the velocity information. So let's drop down a point stop to do that. Oh, I'm sorry, not a point stop. I'm getting ahead of myself. The first thing we need to do is an attribute create, otherwise we can't make the vector. Here we go. So we have our attribute create node, and we're just going to name it v for velocity. And since we want it as a vector, we're going to change the type from float to vector. That way we have an x, a y, and a z for the values. So uh, we can go ahead and uncheck write values because we, we're going to change it now. So um, now we need to hook up a point sop. Um, just to drive this point home, let's open up our geometry spreadsheet. And we can see that per point we have positional information, and we also have the normals, but our velocity is at zero right now. Um, to, uh, to get the velocity, all we're going to do is just copy the normal onto the velocity field. That way the velocity will be pointing along with the direction of the curve. So it's pretty straightforward. Let's select the point here, uh, go into the custom tab, uh, we only need one attribute, and the name was v for velocity. And for the x scalar value, we're going to do dollar sign in x for the x normal. For the second, we're going to do dollar sign in y for the y normal. And for the third one, we're going to do dollar sign in z for the z normal. And uh, that's all we need to do to prepare for the, uh, for the fluid. So we can go ahead and drop our fluid source in now. Oop, I'm not spelling right. Fluid source. OK, um, let's look at what we have here. So we need to change a few things on the fluid source. Uh, the first thing we need to do is go to container settings and we need to change uh, source smoke to velocity. And then you'll notice um, this uh, scalar volumes doesn't have density anymore, it's just V. And velocity volumes has added source attribute as V and it's being visualized as streamers uh, with the name uh, VEL. These two values are very important. Uh, make sure that they're both uh, written here exactly like this. Um, otherwise, things might break. <laughs> um, so that's actually all we need to do here in, the, in this curve. We can go back into our pyrosim and take a look at how this affects our pyrosim. It's not going to do anything if we don't bring the fields in. So the first thing we need to do is drop down a fluid source, or I'm sorry, not a fluid source, a source volume. There's so many nodes with similar names. And we're going to merge it just like we did with the, uh, with the oil from the, from the first example. Um, for the volume path, we're going to choose the curve object and we're going to do the fluid source. Now, unlike the oil example, we're going to change these uh, volume operations a little bit differently. For source volume, we're going to change it to none because we don't need any uh, we don't need any volume and we also don't need any temperature either. The only thing we want from this simulation is the velocity. And instead of copying the velocity, we're going to change it to add so that it adds velocity to the pyrosim every frame. And we're also going to uncheck normalize because it can sometimes clamp the values and uh, we don't really want that for, for what we're doing here. 
Um, we also want to make the smoke a puff of smoke instead of just a uh, uh, you know a continuous stream of smoke. So let's go to frame uh, maybe like frame 20. And in the source smoke, we will key the uh, the source volume to zero. And then at maybe frame 10, we'll key the source volume uh, up to one. So that way for the first 10 frames, or 11 frames in this case, um, it'll be emitting smoke as normal and then when we get to frame 20 uh, it will stop it'll sort of taper off and stop emitting smoke and the last thing we need to do before uh, before checking out how our sim looks is we need to make sure that the bounding box for the simulation is large enough to actually hold all the smoke so you may need to make this larger depending on the size of the curve you drew. So just make sure that nothing's getting cut off. Now let's hit play and see what our simulation looks like. Okay, so it's definitely getting there, but as you can see, um, my smoke's kind of flying off a little too fast. Um, now, there's a lot of different ways that we could address this problem. Um, here's how I'm going to address it. So, depending on how large you do your curve, uh, this solution may or may not actually work. Um, for this scenario, I think it'll work pretty well. So, What's happening is essentially there is just too much velocity um, being pushed in a short amount of time and it's making the smoke not able to uh, to go around this corner. It's like, it's like a car speeding around a corner on a really slick road. It just doesn't have enough traction to get around. So um, instead of keeping the velocity on add, I'm going to change it to copy. And instead of adding velocity every single frame to the animation uh, for the simulation, it's going to just use this field um, as though it were the normal velocity field. So it's not going to like multiply on itself a bunch. So as a result, you see it's going to move really, really slowly. So we're going to have to do something to compensate for that. Uh, normally with add, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, in this case though, we're going to have to take the scale velocity and we're going to have to make it pretty high. Um, we can try 5 at first and see what that gives us. Five is actually not terrible. I kind of like how that looks. Uh, the smoke could maybe be a little denser, although, you know, that's really controlled in the render settings, but if we want to see um, some slightly denser smoke, we could always go to where we animated this uh, scale source volume and change it from one a little higher, maybe to like two and a half. Now we have a denser blob of smoke moving across. So, again, uh, depending on your scene scale, a lot of things when we're working with dynamics are going to change uh, from person to person. So, uh, it's more important that you uh, really pay attention to like the reasoning behind making all these changes. So that uh, if you're working on a project and uh, suddenly you know things go wrong and uh, and you know like copying the velocity or adding the velocity doesn't work you know try copy um, see if it's just has to do with the scene scale in relation to how tight their curves were uh, in this case it seems like that was the culprit so um, there's one more thing that I want to do uh, before we end this and that is 
uh, I really like the motion of this uh, of this curve. It's kind of nice, um, but I think we can spice it up just a little bit more with two uh, two really quick changes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the curve object. We're gonna go all the way up to our curve. I've got this edit from when I move the points around a little. And uh, we're going to make this a little more three-dimensional. So I'm going to select some points. And I'm just going to move these over. Select this one, maybe move it up, up and out a bit. So then instead of like an S shape, this is more of like a spiral. Um, that'll give a, that'll make our simulation look a little nicer. Give it a little more, I don't know, whimsy, <laughs> I guess, if it comes out as a spiral as opposed to just uh, kind of the sterile looking S shape. Push this up a little bit, and yeah, I like that. The second change that I want to make is in the fluid source node. So if we look at our visualization, um, it looks like we've lost chunks of our velocity, but that's just because we're... Uh, we're only viewing a single plane for the velocity, so the, the velocity is still there on the on these other parts of the curves that got pushed in and out. It's just uh, it's just not being uh, visualized in this slice right now. Uh, the other change that I want to make is the smoke moves in a pretty uh, uniform manner, and in the fluid source, when we're underneath the velocity volumes, there's this uh, tab called curl noise, and if we add curl noise, it makes our velocity field look a lot more, you know, random and chaotic. Now this is a bit too much. We're actually not gonna get it following the curve at all with the scale of one. So I just want to tone this down. so that the hot spots um, are still, you know, quite red and orange. But we just got these cooler, like, blue and green fields of velocity that um, show us, you know, we've got a, lot, a little bit of swirling going on here so that the, the smoke doesn't just follow a plain curved path. Um, so it'll have a little bit more uh, jittery motion to it when it moves, and it'll it will really look a lot more natural. So let's take a look at this again. And actually, I'm going to take a look at this with uh, hide other objects. That way, we can actually see the smoke. Okay, now that that's had a chance to cash out a little bit, let's uh, rewind and look at our smoke simulation. And it's looking really nice. Let's play that again from a different angle, maybe from the top so we can see the swirl pattern. Oh, there's one more thing I forgot to do. You're all probably yelling at me by this point keep forgetting this uh, <laughs> I keep forgetting to resize the container so let me go ahead and show other objects and let's just visualize the curve so that I know how large to make this uh, pyro container
All right, let's rewind it and play it one last time. So now we can see the final result. Um, this effect is starting to look really cool. Um, we've got our smoke following the curve just the way we want it to, and it's not really deviating from the path, but at the same time, you know, it's got just a little bit of that turbulence um, as it travels along the path to make it look a little more natural. Um, that's where we're going to end for this example, but of course, you know, you can always go in uh, to the pyro and the pyro solver node, right? Uh, lower the division size, start uh, playing with the shape values to give uh, to give your smoke a lot more, you know, smaller details, and then, you know, we could we could render it out and have a really cool looking effect. So uh, that's it for part two of the pyro effects videos. Um, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.